Uh, welcome. I'm excited to introduce the second uh, PCR webinar on ischemia and no obstructive coronary arteries. Uh, the focus for this session will be on causes. I'm excited to introduce our panel members, uh, Dr. Carlos Colley from Alst, Belgium, Professor Xavier Escaned from Hospital San Carlos in Madrid, in Spain, and Dr. Jennifer Tremel from Stanford University Medical Center in the United States. Welcome everyone. A special welcome to our participants. Uh, thank you for making the time to join our webinar this evening. And I would encourage you to submit questions uh, please do uh, uh, present your name and your, your medical centre or university, and that will help us contextualise um, the question. Um, we'll take questions in two, two parts of the, the session uh, in the second half. So um, I'll now move to introduce the learning objectives for this session. We will focus on microcirculatory dysfunction and the specific uh, causes and mechanisms uh, leading to ischemia with no obstructive coronary arteries in OCA. We'll give some focus on dominant endotypes of microvascular uh, dysfunction. And importantly, we'll also focus on the role of myocardial bridges. So in the coming slides, I'll uh, discuss uh, the classifications and the definitions of endotypes and the ESC guidelines. I'd like to highlight the 2019 guidelines for the diagnosis and management of chronic coronary syndromes. Um, Professor Eskenad was a, a lead author on those guidelines. And uh, these guidelines give focus to ENOCA, the endotypes, and treatments, diagnosis and treatments. I'd like to highlight um, the guideline practice recommendations uh, for three particular uh, contexts for diagnostic testing. Guidewire-based CFR and microcirculatory resistance measurements should be considered in patients with persistent symptoms but coronary arteries that are either angiographically normal or have moderate uh, stenosis with preserved uh, non-flow limiting disease. There is a 2A, uh, class 2A level of B evidence recommendation. For acetylcholine testing, there's a 2B recommendation reflecting a lesser body of evidence. And also non-invasively um, for transthoracic Doppler and PET perfusion and CMR 2B recommendations. We have diagnostic criteria for microvascular angina, which is a key endotype um, of, of patients who may have uh, one form of um, uh, microvascular microcirculatory dysfunction. To make a diagnosis according to the Covadis group, there should be um, symptoms consistent with myocardial ischemia, no obstructive coronary artery disease, objective evidence of myocardial ischemia from some form of stress testing and or invasive evidence of microcirculatory dysfunction. And in the interest of time, I won't go into the detail of that, but I'd like to highlight the publication in the International Journal of Cardiology. So three of the four criteria lead to a diagnosis of probable microvascular angina, and it is the first three, and all four is definite. In terms of classification of microvascular dysfunction and relatedly microvascular angina, there are four types. And this classification was proposed by Paolo Canici and Filippo Crea in their New England Journal paper in 2007. Four types. So the endotype is of no obstructive coronary disease, which from a pathogenesis perspective associates with risk factors, myocardial disease, cardiomyopathy, obstructive coronary artery disease, with associated microvascular dysfunction. Um, of course, um, that's uh, obstructive disease, maybe treated by PCI. And then uh, relatedly, um, PCI itself may cause uh, microvascular dysfunction, and that is type four. Let's not forget about vasospastic angina, 
which may occur in isolation or in association with microvascular angina. Um, there are specific criteria, again, uh, elucidated by the Covadis group, uh, nitrate responsive, transient ischemic ECG changes, and importantly, coronary artery spasm uh, revealed uh, by provocative testing and angiography. This can be brought together in the catheter laboratory um, in terms of the presence of coronary atherosclerosis as revealed by the angiogram, the use of a diagnostic sensor to assess for flow limiting disease, and then with thermotolution or with Doppler to assess for micro microcirculatory dysfunction, be it an increase in resistance or an impairment on vasodilator reserve. So at this moment, I'd just like to uh, consider um, as a group, our thoughts on these criteria, are they, are they helpful? Um, do we think about them in clinical practice? Uh, should we think more about these, these criteria in clinical practice? Um, Javier, perhaps I could ask you to uh, consider these points. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Well, I think that this uh, is something that to put in context uh, all that you have shared with us. Uh, you know, I remember that when I was training as a cardiologist, uh, it was the time that there was a lot of interest in this thing called syndrome X, which I think that very eloquently speaks about how puzzled the community was about the fact that someone might have ischemia and apparently normal coronary arteries. And I think that um, what you have shown beautifully as well is that, you know, even, even when we had later the classification by CREA and Kamichi about the different type of uh, groups of microvascular dysfunction, there was some confusion as well, thinking that microvascular dysfunction is a single entity. And I think that that's the reason because it's so interesting, as you are suggesting uh, now, that you should think more in different mechanisms of this function that can be um, um, incorporated into these endotypes than thinking that um, in the uh, microvascular dysfunction is a single entity. Right. Um, in the cath lab, it can be very busy. You've done the angiogram, and it appears that you know there's no obstructive disease. End of story. Now, I'd, I'd like to suggest that if clinicians are familiar with these diagnostic criteria, we realize that this isn't the end of the story. Actually, there are still some further clinical considerations and we can benchmark our thinking in real time to these kind of categorical uh, pieces of information. Uh, Carlos. Yeah, Colin, I think that the, the, one of the most important points that the guidelines bring us to clinical practice is having a formal recommendation on when to perform this test. And this is extremely useful because it positions yourself in the common situation of a patient with angina and normal epicardial vessels. And now with a formal recommendation and further on with clear criteria for standardization of diagnosis, I think it's a major step forward to better identify the patient suffering from, from microcirculatory dysfunction. Right. Jennifer, any, would you like to add? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I have several thoughts, uh, but uh, sure. I would start with, I think the evolution of all this is moving in the right direction. A lot of investigators around the world are getting sort of different information, and I think we're starting to put it all together, um, which is helpful. And so this is a moving target that's becoming clearer over time. Um, you know, even simple things about with the devices we use and, you know, what do we do when CFRs uh, normal, but IMR is abnormal, and we're starting to sort that out. Um, I think there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, you know, things like slow flow, I think we just still don't know a lot about. Um, when I've tested people with slow flow, um, I can't always find something wrong with microcirculation. Um, so there's a lot still to do, but I do think everything's moving in the right direction, and these categories are helpful as we piece together more data. Great. So perhaps we can consider pathophysiology um, in, in more detail, and I'd like to hand over to Xavier uh, in his coming slides. Thank you, uh, Colin. Yeah, so I think it's, to me what it was very sort of clarifying was uh, 
uh, understanding or thinking in the coronary circulation as a analog of a um, hydraulic system where you have different resistances. And of course, typically you have the picardial vessels that in the absence of an stenosis uh, have very low resistance. Then you have the arteries, which actually, which, which actually uh, have the role of modulating the resistance and to um, and therefore adjust a flow to myocardial oxygen demands. And then you have the capillary network. And I think that uh, following what you shared with us before, we have many different um, dysfunction pathways in this microcirculatory domain. Some of them happen typically in acute coronary syndromes, perhaps intraluminal obstruction is in, coronary syndrome, in acute coronary syndromes. Also, as you mentioned, in iatrogenic uh, dysfunction following PCI, extravascular compression also in acute coronary syndromes. But in the patient with INOCA, which uh, by definition is a chronic coronary syndrome, there are uh, two different types of mechanisms, uh, pathological dysfunction pathways that should be explored. One is um, the remodeling of the microcirculation, which is um, a very important part of the, of the problem. And that in a way is related by, to many of the cardiovascular risk factors that also caused uh, atherosclerosis in angina. So it can coexist also with the presence of obstructive disease in some patients. Typically, what you may have in this situation is either that the arteries become thick and non-responsive, or even, you know, with an obliterated lumen, or you can have a decrease in, uh, in the density of uh, capillaries in the, in the, in the in myocardium. And actually, in, 2009, in 2009, we did a some work where we used endomyocardial biopsies to um, compare the findings in these biopsies with the physiological indexes that we were measuring. And we realized that actually both the decrease in capillary density, which in some situations can be dramatic, and also the degree of arterial thickening contribute to abnormal resistance. Now, something that we have to keep in mind is that um, some of these changes, the structural changes in the microcirculation, run along with other changes in the myocardium. This is a good example of it. In hypertensive heart disease, for example, you may have typically this thickening of arterioles, abnormal arterioles, smooth muscle cells that are hyperreactive, uh, decreasing conductance of the microcirculation. But as you can see in this model uh, you have at the right, you can also have an increase of fibrous tissue in the myocardium, which of course accounts for some of the deleterious effect of this condition. So you may have problems in microcirculation that go along with the structural changes also in the myocardium itself. And then the other group of um, dysfunction pathways that you have is the vasomotor disorders that may affect both the epicardial vessels and the arterioles. Typically, when it is related to endothelial dysfunction, it is a um, it follows uh, the fact that uh, the small arterioles will vasodilate uh, according to metabolites released by myocardium, but the larger arterioles actually will vasodilate uh, through uh, flow-mediated mechanisms. That is uh, where the endothelial uh, cell plays a very important role. And if you have endothelial dysfunction, you will have a failure in vasodilate. You may even have vasoconstriction at this particular level. And sometimes this uh, failure in the upstream vasodilation will get reflected also in the epicardial vessels. Now, um, Colin uh, and his group in Glasgow did very interesting research looking to the patients that have INOCA and looking to how the arterioles in other parts of the body were reacting to um, acetylcholine. And what they found is that actually the same abnormalities in endothelial function that they found in the epicardial vessels could be demonstrated also in the arterioles obtained in gluteal biopsy. So this opens the possibility that in some patients, at least in some patients, microvascular dysfunction is a systemic disease. So we should keep in mind, uh, and I think that, you know, that's something that I'm sure that we are going to be discussing um, over the next uh, slides and, and talks, is that uh, there are many conditions associated to microvascular dysfunction, uh, that, like arterial hypertension, diabetes mellitus, dyslipidemia, estrogen withdrawal, left ventricular hypertrophy, I mentioned before the, the hypertensive heart, Lipid-rich arteriosclerosis, when you have uh, lipid-rich plaques, you typically have uh, that they are covered by uh, dysfunctional endothelium, chronic total occlusion, myocardial bridges, myocarditis, and of course, uh, cardiac allograft vasculopathy. This is not the full list, 
but this just speaks about the many different clinical situations where you may have um, uh, the presence of these uh, dysfunction pathways. Okay, thank you. That's really insightful. Um, amazing to see the, the vascular histopathology, you know, something, of course, that, you know, we just don't see in clinical practice. We're taking measurements, but we don't seal uh, the vessel. So that was really uh, insightful. Um, I wonder if, Jennifer, would you like to make some comments um, about um, what Xavier has shared with us? <clears throat> Yeah, well, I think this is all an important part of understanding, um, you know, what we're seeing when we do these tests in the cath lab. Um, so, you know, this more kind of basic science look is important. Um, tying it all together sometimes is uh, still challenging, you know, even things like Oh, a lot of this is caused from cardiac risk factors, yet a lot of these patients maybe don't have cardiac risk factors, or we haven't proven at this point if we modify cardiac risk factors that we're actually going to make them feel better. Um, so I think, again, uh, we still have a lot of work in, in kind of pulling it all together, um, but um, all of these uh, levels of research are very important. The, the complexity is clear. It's multifactorial and usually no one single intervention is going to make a real difference to the patient. We need to think about all of these factors, the age of life, the sex, the measurements in the catheter laboratory, non-invasive ischemia testing left. You know, actually, it's, it's, it's exciting to engage with this type of, of, of situation. It, it's sort of, um, as clinicians, it's empowering us to think. Uh, Carlos, yeah. um, any comments about yeah, so I think that Javier uh, put it very clear. So we have structural abnormalities, we have functional abnormalities, and both can coexist at the same time. So that right. indeed adds another layer of complexity to, to, to understand what is really happening in the microcirculation. One of the things that we have also seen, for example, Javier mentioned patients with uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, where the resistance in the microcirculation might be high, but it's not uh, the primary mechanism of myocardial dysfunction. So there yeah. we use the information from the resistance as a marker of risk and prognosis yeah. for that specific patient rather than the primary mechanism for, for, for the complaints. Yeah, so that's type two microvascular dysfunction. Um, great, that's really interesting. We've been receiving questions, um, and actually, I think we've covered some of them in this discussion. That you know, functional and structural problems, a low CFR and a high IMR or a high HMR, can exist uh, concomitantly. And then, of course, uh, if acetylcholine reactivity testing is done, then that discloses another um, potentially a functional problem. But nonetheless a treatment like a calcium channel blocker can be unifying for actually all three of these problems or specifically for, for one um, in terms of how it can ameliorate impaired vasodilatation. So, Carlos, could I invite you to share with us your, your really interesting cases? Yeah, pleasure. So we're going to present three cases now, and each of these cases represent the different endotypes and sometimes a combination of both. And the idea is to present these three cases together, and then we'll have a, a discussion about this. So the first case is uh, a gentleman, 54 years old. You see 28 of BMI. His medical history, hyperlipidemia, and hypertension. This patient came to our consultation with typical angina, class 1 to 2, and the ejection fraction by echo was normal, and also the renal function was normal. The first test that we uh, decided for this patient was an exercise test. And this actually showed that it was positive for ischemia, both because of clinical criteria, the patient had pain during the exercise, and also you see the um, depression of the ST segment in the peak exercise. So it was a clearly a positive test. So this patient uh, was referred to our CAT lab. We were thinking maybe on an epicardial disease, given the risk factors and the, and the typically the typicality of the complaints. So we took this gentleman to the cat lab and the, both uh, the right and the left coronary artery were without any obstructive lesions. So we proceeded with our uh, protocol for uh, INOCA, 
And we started with a measurement of CFR and IMR. What you see in the screen is actually the test, the test that is performed first in resting conditions. And those are the blue lines that appear on the, on the bottom of the slide. And then we induce hyperemia to assess the microvascular resistance during hyperemic conditions. And these are shown by the bolus thermodilution curve in yellow. So what we observe in this case, and I will make a zoom on the, on the findings, is that the FFR was 0.9. It was uh, not uh, pathological from the epicardial point of view, but this gentleman had a very low CFR, a low CFR 2.1, with a high uh, IMR of 32. One of the things that we notice is that uh, if we uh, look at the IMR in the previous case, we repeated the IMR just to understand a little bit more that we were actually measuring the microvascular resistance in the correct way. And you see when we repeat this measurement, again, 38 of IMR pointing at the fact, if we look at the consensus that Colin presented, uh, well above the cutoff of point of 25. So uh, to conclude, in the first case, this patient had definitive microvascular angina with the four criteria, angina, no epicardial CAD, evidence of ischemia, and impaired microvascular function. Briefly, what we did in terms of management, this patient was, uh, uh, in terms of medication, prescribed with bisoprolol, five milligram. He was already on ramipril and uh, also statins. We also insist on the uh, improvement of the uh, amount of sport that this gentleman was doing and also in terms of uh, his healthy uh, uh, food. So the next case is another time an Inoka patient, and this is a very interesting case. This is a female of 69 years old with a BMI of 34. Medical history, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and sleep apnea syndrome, and she presented with complaints of angina in rest. Uh, the creatinine and the GFR you will see they're, are, they're reduced. And she already underwent uh, invasive coronary angiography three years ago that was normal. But she kept having the complaint in the last three years. She came to our clinic. We started with a CT angiography. And these are the straight NPRs of the right, LAD and circumflex arteries showing no epicardial disease. So we were really confident to take this patient out to our microcirculation clinic in the cat lab. And we started by uh, performing an acetylcholine uh, provocation test for spasm. This is the baseline angiography. You will see here again, no epicardial disease, confirming the findings of the coronary CT with a normal baseline ECG. For the sake of time, I'm going to jump to the uh, last doses of acetylcholine that was administered. And this is uh, an angiography after the administration of 100 micrograms of intracoronary acetylcholine and you will see clearly the reduction in diameter in the LAD with a diffuse spasm coming from the ostium to the distal part of the vessel. You will see also in the ECG ischemic changes now with ST depression and negative T wave. And at that time, the patient said, this is what I feel uh, when I have the chest pain. So we were really confident that we identify the uh, uh, endotype that was causing the pain in this lady. Just to give you a comparison, we inject nitrates to assess how uh, significant this spasm was. And you see before and after nitrates, the huge difference in vessel diameter uh, in this big LAD that turned out to be very big after the use of nitrates. We uh, followed the uh, acetylcholine protocol with again a measurement of CFR and IMR. And you will you see in the screen again is that the CFR in this lady was 2.2, again, based on bolus thermodilution technique with an IMR of 0.27. So this lady indeed has a mixed endotype of epicardial spasm and also microvascular dysfunction. Uh, following the criteria, in this case, we uh, again took advantage of the fact that we're doing more and more CTs, and now we're using this to prepare the patient before it comes to the cat lab. We treated this lady with Diltiacen, 240 milligrams, Ulmesartan, Rosovastatin, and aspirin, as you see in the slide. To close the round of cases, this is case number three. And this is about, again, a female of 41 years old, BMI 21, with a medical history of diabetes, and she presented with a typical chest pain. Uh, she referred that the pain, the pain was sometimes in rest, sometimes during exercise. So we're not really sure whether this was really a cardiac origin of the complaints. Uh, 
the renal and the left ventricular function were normal. We performed an exercise test that was negative for ischemia. Nevertheless, we decided to uh, uh, take her to the CAT lab and we started with the acetylcholine provocation test. And this is the baseline uh, uh, injection. You will see here uh, normal epicardial vessel again, confirming the absence of epicardial coronary artery disease and a relatively normal ECG next to it. After the third doses, in this case, 100 micrograms of, of intracoronary acetylcholine, the patient started to feel pain. And you will see clearly in the ECG, the huge ST depression and ischemic changes that are shown there in several uh, of the leads. Therefore, this patient, uh, then we completed the analysis, not looking at the uh, coronary uh, uh, dysfunction with CFR and IMR, the title is wrong. And here we observe that this lady had a CFR that was uh, very uh, low, but I have to say that as you saw in the first angiography, this lady was tachycardic as from the beginning. So we don't consider that the measurements performing rest are really reliable. Nevertheless, when we induce hyperemia, and this was done with IV adenosine, and we perform again three uh, bolus injections to assess the IMR. The IMR in this case was seven, well below the threshold of 25. So we have in this case a patient that had the same complaints during the infusion of acetylcholine with changes in the ECG without epicardial spasm. And this qualify as a microvascular spasm with preserved microvascular function. She was treated again with calcium antagonist, diltiazem, 180 milligrams, and medication for diabetes and hyperlipidemia. Carlos, thank you. Um, three really interesting cases, uh, differences in clinical presentation and test strategy. The first case, um, you know, really striking ST segment depression. And in, in my training, <clears throat> When we saw that, or alternatively with uh, nuclear SPECT testing, you know, perfusion defects, the patient goes to the cath lab, these tests, the exercise test and SPECT were generally maligned as being a uh, false negative. You know, the angiograms, no obstructive disease, and then we get into sort of difficult context, though, you know, patients overweight, and, you know, so actually, these cases are really illuminating because now we can bring together um, the well-established test strategies that have been used and help understand that these are not false negative or false positive results. It's just that we lacked the tools. Um, we now have the tools to make um, po a positive diagnosis to rule in or rule out uh, in ways that in the 20 years that I've been working in cardiology, there's a lot of uncertainty and, um, you know, misappropriation of, of test results and, and, and patients. Um, Javier, do you have any comments on the cases? Well, I think that they, they were excellent, excellent um, illustrations of actually the opportunity of performing this test in the CAT lab, because you can consider it a one-stop uh, shop where you can actually uh, look to the different um, pathways of this function that you uh, commented with us before, Colin. And I think that it is, it is clear that without this information, it would be impossible to really differentiate so clearly, as, as Carlos has shared with us, what was happening in each of these patients. I think following what you are saying, our experience as well, is that for the patient, it's very revealing to see that actually you can trigger the, um, the pain that you know, has been there for a long time and that many, in many occasions, you know, there was no explanation provided to them. So removing this uh, diagnostic uncertainty is something that helps a lot to the patient. Sometimes, even if it, it takes some time to find what is the, 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 the treatment, just the, um, the, the, the diagnostic process is something that really uh, helps the patient in understanding that we are in the right track to solve uh, his or her problem. So if I could add some um, viewpoints. So one, um, I like that your first case was a man. Um, so remembering that men can have microvascular dysfunction as well, because um, we always think of women. Um, and while you know we, we get more women with normal coronaries and angina, men certainly are affected. 
Um, in your third case, I think it's notable that there you couldn't show ischemia ahead of time. And I know our guidelines and everything are around ischemia and ischemia uh, feels right to us, but I also think that our stress tests are still uh, a little bit limited in finding ischemia in these settings and that we shouldn't deny patients extra testing because we can't find ischemia because a lot of them, we're not going to be able to show it with a traditional stress test. And on that last patient, it's also interesting, you know, the CFR was very low, IMR was normal, and he said, well, maybe it's from just the heart rate being up um, and this high flow, but there, you know, is now this consideration that that high flow itself is abnormal um, and that that's representation of a functional problem with a microvasculature and your patient had, you know, endothelial dependent microvascular dysfunction. It may be that at this point they have high flow and this higher heart rate simply to keep perfusion going during these, these times of microvascular dysfunction. So it's more of a functional problem with the microvasculature as opposed to structural um, that might help explain that discrepancy that you see. And I would just conclude with the fact that it's important in these patients to actually do all the tests uh, because it may not just be one of the tests as you demonstrated it, it may be a combination thereof and you really need to uh, understand the whole picture with these patients. Yeah, great, great comments, Jennifer. Um, of course, acetylcholine isn't widely available, um, but I think your point's well made. Um, but I would encourage um, our clinicians and those who are uh, listening today that uh, some form of testing is way better than no testing. Uh, and the guide wire is certainly um, guide wire, um, or whatever test technology may be available, um, should be considered in a patient with symptoms not explained by the angiogram. So um, we're making good time, which is, which is great. And we have some questions have been coming in. Um, and uh, let me see. So, let's see. There's questions about drug treatment um, and doses of drugs. So, Carlos, you're your cases were very clear. You named the drugs that the patients had and you named the drug doses. Um, would you care to consider about the starting dose of an individual drug? Um, what would be your approach in a, a patient who's treatment naive? Would you go straight for like a, a truly therapeutic dose like 180, 360 of diltiazem, or would you start at a lower dose to try and ensure tolerance? Well, Colin, that's a very good question. And I think uh, in patients with microvascular disease, the, the therapy should be personalized. You'll see that these patients often have more comorbidities there are in other drugs. So I normally start with, uh, I explain to the patient that we have found what we think is the cause of the pain. That is already reassuring for them. And then I, I plan uh, uh, starting the drugs with some tritation in the next weeks. And I, I usually explain to my patients, listen, we're going to start with a small dose. Uh, then we're going to see if we need to increase in the next two, four weeks. And this is the way that we approach uh, most of the patients with low doses at the beginning. And then we uh, go up. It's not a surprising, Colin, that sometimes the doses that you end up using are pretty high. Uh, but that depends on, on each patient. I think uh, uh, every patient responds differently to, to different doses. But we're not uh, scared anymore or putting high, high doses of some of the medication because sometimes that is what the patient needs. And, and after you reach a high dose, you get uh, uh, the complaints get better. And, and these are, in general, chronic conditions. So, you know, the treatment that a patient can be established on, they're going to be on it for could be on it for a long time. Um, so starting at a lower dose to ensure tolerance and then to try and personalize um, to control symptoms. So that question was from Dr. Alwesi and I'd like to thank um, the doctor for that question. We've got another question from Dr. Holland. 
Um, Javier, I think this could be a good one for you. Um, so the question is about whether measuring microvascular uh, function in one vessel is sufficient or sh would you encourage three vessel assessments, trading logistics and time and safety? Uh, what, what would be your approach uh, to that? Thank you, Colin. Well, it's, it's, it's a very good question. Uh, and as you say, the, there is a trade-off, you know, between making this a simple uh, uh, study. Actually, you can perform it as part of your diagnostic angiogram and takes 15, perhaps 20 extra minutes uh, and you complete the whole thing. If you interrogate uh, one artery, that typically is what we do, the left anterior descending. Why the left anterior descending? Because we think that you know it provides blood to a large area of myocardium is very representative and it provides provides us a very relevant uh, information about you know a significant part of the um, um, irrigation of the left ventricle of course if you have some specific information you know in someone that you have a suspicion that there is a vasospastic angina and you have been able to document EKG changes that are predominant in other vessels, like in the, in the inferior wall of the left ventricle, then you might consider exploring also the right coronary artery. But for the purpose of INOCA, we typically um, choose the left anterior descending coronary artery. And in the documents that uh, were shared with you by, by, by Colin is, is the recommendation that is laid out. Yeah, great, thank you, Javier. Um, I... In a patient uh, who has symptoms and the test results are negative in the LED, I would, I would be inclined um, to uh, assess a second vessel. Um, generally, I'll stick with a single vessel unless the test results in the first vessel are negative because I wouldn't wish for the patient to have gone through this experience and have a false negative test result. And of course, the results may very well be concordant in the second vessel, but there can be some, sometimes some variations in, in, uh, in, the, in the measurements. Um, we're making a great time, um, neither late nor, nor ahead of time, uh, but I think it might be the right moment, um, Jennifer, um, if we would go to your talk on myocardial bridges. <clears throat> okay, my pleasure. Hopefully I'll keep us uh, still on time. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about myocardial bridges, uh, which don't always get a lot of attention. So, um, you know, whether we like it or not, I think that myocardial bridges are a commonly overlooked cause of angina in patients without obstructive disease. And if we do all this testing for vasospastic angina and microvascular dysfunction, we still have about half of our patients that walk away without a diagnosis. And it may be that um, we need to be looking for something else. And we really came across this uh, many years ago because in our patients, we've done IBIS uh, in every single patient for over a decade. And I started to notice that we had a lot of bridges uh, in these patients, quite disproportionately high from what we would expect in the general population. So patients with angina and normal coronaries have a rate of about 60%, at least in our cohort, of myocardial bridging, whereas in the general population, we think that the it's about an average of about 30% of the population. So why are myocardial bridges overlooked? I think one of the biggest things is because we're taught that bridges are inconsequential. Uh, and I was taught bridges are inconsequential. And so it, some of this is kind of overcoming what we were taught um, by the data and, and we're at some point finally faced with the fact that we probably need to reconsider that. The other reason is that these can be very challenging to diagnose. Actually, only a minority of them are seen on invasive angiography. And if you look at prevel the prevalence in studies that simply use angiography, it's, it's underestimated how many bridges there are. Even when people see a narrowing, they often think that it's due to a stenosis rather than a bridge. Interestingly, uh, coronary CTA is a, the non-invasive gold standard, and that's where we can see them as well, but it's often not mentioned, and that we even had this at our own institution where they just didn't mention it, and it's because radiologists were taught that these were you know, inconsequential as well and didn't need to be mentioned. So I think um, that's something you may have to have a discussion with your radiologist about if you want to start noticing these 
superficial all the way to deep myocardial bridges. Um, they're also common in the general population, as I mentioned, and so it can be hard to differentiate when is this simply um, an incidental finding and when is it a hemodynamically significant bridge. Another issue is that these are rarely identified on routine stress testing. Uh, so we do have patients where there's reports of antroceptal ischemia on nuclear perfusion scans uh, or with MR or autopsy, septal ischemia or infarction is noted. But in general, um, regular stress tests may not see this. We have found an interesting finding on stress echocardiography of focal septobuckling with apical sparing. And you can see that here. So this is at rest. And then with stress, what you see is the apex is actually coming in normally, which would indicate you don't have an LAV stenosis, yet you have this funny buckling in the mid uh, septum. And this finding um, we have found is highly accurate for the presence of a myocardial bridge, but does not necessarily mean that it's hemodynamically significant. So this basically gets you at least through screening if you're looking for myocardial bridges. So as mentioned, seeing myocardial bridges on angiography can uh, sometimes be challenging. So this patient um, in the mid uh, LAD has a myocardial bridge at baseline, can't necessarily tell. Um, with nitroglycerin, you see a little bit of winking there in the mid LAD. Um, and nitroglycerin brings this out, right, because the rest of the artery dilates. Um, it usually increases heart rate. Um, and this is where a myth was developed that Nitro was contraindicated in patients with bridges because it looks worse on angiography. Um, but what I'm going to tell you, in fact, is a lot of patients respond nicely to nitrates uh, when they have a myocardial bridge. And the reason is probably because endothelial dysfunction is commonly associated with myocardial bridging. And so here's an example where we give acetylcholine in a patient with a myocardial bridge, and then they have this significant narrowing in the or constriction in the mid vessel. Um, and I've seen many people, um, experts in our field, show this and say, well, this patient has vasospastic angina. And I suppose so, but they're missing the fact that there is an underlying myocardial bridge as well, um, which is important to know because it may have different implications for treatment. The other thing that people always wonder about is, well, if we're born with these, why in the world are they not bothering us till later in life? Um, and I think we don't totally know the answer, but um, one is that maybe this development of endothelial dysfunction becomes a problem as people get older. Uh, people get LVH, um, which is going to change the dynamics of the bridge. The ventricles get stiffer as well. And then we know that there is almost invariably a proximal plaque uh, with these bridges, which likely gets worse over time um, and can change flow dynamics as well. I will highlight the fact that uh, we do see these in pediatric patients. And um, so we've tested young kids. Um, the pediatric field has actually been much more open to the concept of myocardial, myocardial bridges causing angina. Um, and we've published on a series of children who've been unroofed um, with resolution in their symptoms. So the invasive um, gold standard is intravascular imaging. We use IVIS. You can do this with OCT, but the depth is different, and so myocardial bridges look different with OCT. Um, what you see with IVIS is an echolucent half-moon sign, um, which we call a halo. We've looked at this histopathologically, and this is actually the myocardium overlying the vessel. Um, and then we expect to see at least 10% compression with this as well. So another important thing to understand is that the compressive, compressive effects of the bridge are not limited just to systole. So another thing that we're taught early on is, oh, bridges don't matter because bridges only compress the artery in systole, but coronary perfusion is occurring during diastole, and so patients are getting enough blood flow. And we've actually known since the mid-1990s um, that this systolic compression can extend into early diastole in these patients um, so that they are getting a delayed um, relaxation in diastole. And we see this with Doppler here, where basically the coronary perfusion is peaking at the same time that there are compressive effects on the artery, which is causing this um, high peak in the flow velocity. And then suddenly those compression, compressive effects release and there's a drop, um, and this is called a fingertip that we'll see um, on these patients when we do flow velocity testing. 
So if you're testing these patients for hemodynamic significance, I think, um, you know, Javier really had uh, the seminal paper on this, and we went to this paper when we were trying to figure out how can we test these patients. Um, an important point is that myocardial bridges are dynamic rather than fixed, like a coronary stenosis. So you need to create um, that dynamic effect to test the uh, hemodynamic significance. So for a fixed stenosis, we can use adenosine, which is a vasodilator. Um, but in a myocardial bridge, you actually want inotropy and chronotropy to bring out those effects. So you're looking at using dobutamine or exercise as an alternative. For a fixed stenosis, in addition, um, systole and diastole are both affected. Um, and so we can take a mean FFR when we do uh, a, a test on a fixed stenosis, um, but that's not the case in a myocardial bridge. The main effect in a myocardial bridge is in diastole, um, and there can actually be an overshoot in systole where the pressures in the artery get higher than the pressures in the aorta. And so if you use a mean, you're going to underestimate uh, the hemodynamic effects of the bridge. So you really need a diastolic uh, value to see uh, if there's any issues. So um, this is an example. Sorry, I'm having my computer wants to shut down. I hope it doesn't. Here's an example um, of the pressures and flow velocities in a bridge at rest. And you can see that the aortic and coronary pressures are uh, both within normal limits. And then you can see that fingertip within the bridge on the flow velocities. And then this was with dobutamine stress. So you see with the pressures, the systolic pressures in the aorta and the coronary stay equivalent, but there's this dramatic decrease in the diastolic uh, pressures um, in, in the bridge as well as distal to the bridge. So I think an interesting area that we need to look into further is do, you know, what, what measurements can we use? There are actually several diastolic indices available nowadays. Um, and there was one little study looking at IFR, um, which compared it to FFR and said that it was um, better than FFR, which would make sense. Um, you know, we have IFR, we have RFR, um, we have lots of different measurements. And I think, I, I don't think at this point we can assume that they're all equivalent in bridges, particularly since there are dynamic things happening in diastole. Um, it may be that you want to capture a certain part of diastole, and these all capture different parts of diastole. So I think we have a little work to go there. I would also say that I don't expect resting indices are going to be enough and that we probably need dobutamine or exercise, uh, but that also remains to be seen. So with regard to treatment, um, our guidelines typically say, you know, beta block blockers are the first line and then calcium channel blockers. Um, and this is what we do. If they have any endothelial dysfunction as well, um, I will often pick nabivalol as my beta blocker because it has nitric oxide um, dilating properties. And uh, same, I will add nitrates in these patients, which is aw awfully helpful. Um, the, it's important to know we actually have no trials looking at these medications at all. So these were kind of derived, um, the beta blocker was derived from like a small cohort that got esmolol in the cath lab and it seemed to help and there's nothing about calcium channel blockers. So another area for research. Um, stenting can be a problem in this uh, situation because the stent can get comp compressed and uh, cabbage is not always helpful either. Uh, so we need to uh, keep that in mind. I've actually had to study a lot of patients who got bypass. It did not help with their bridge pain. And then I don't know how to get my slide back. But surgical unroofing um, can be another um, mechanism for these patients who fail medical management but have an intolerable quality of life. And we've published on um, the significant improvements in angina and quality of life with surgical unroofing with these patients. So in conclusion, I would um, encourage people to consider myocardial bridging as a cause of angina in non-obstructive coronary artery disease. I would say do not rely on the coronary angiogram to say there's no bridge present. Um, you need intravascular ultrasound or a coronary CTA. Um, and then understand that the myocardial bridge um, has compressive effects that is in, extend into diastole. So it's uh, not that they're inconsequential and don't affect diastole. Um, at the same time, having a bridge and having angina doesn't mean that the bridge is 
flaws. And so ultimately testing is important to figure out if that's playing a role. And remember, it can be associated with endothelial dysfunction. So I'll highlight again that we need to do all the tests in these patients to understand exactly what's going on. Um, medical management is helpful in most cases, but in those who fail medical management and have an intolerable quality of life, surgical unroofing is an option. Thank you. Fantastic, Jennifer. Thank you for that uh, really insightful uh, overview. Uh, Javier, would you like to make some comments? You've done so much work in this in this area. <clears throat> Thank you, Colin. But uh, well, we it's true that we were very interested, and in that as you mentioned, as um, we did some uh, work um, in the early two thousand. But you know, the group of uh, Jennifer Tremel has done a tremendous um, job in integrating so many different things. And I think that one of the the, the, the most recent paper from his group is really an outstanding compendium of all these different um, layers of dysfunction that are happening in, in myocardial bridges. My impression is that we have moved from thinking that it is mainly um, a cause of um, dynamic obstruction due to extravascular compression to understanding that also you have a lot of uh, hyperreactivity due to perhaps endothelial dysfunction who knows if also hyperactivity due to smooth muscle cells. So I think that uh, what it is clear is that this, uh, as Jennifer has highlighted, is uh, something that shouldn't be overlooked because it's a very important uh, component of uh, INOCA. Carlos, would you like to make some comments? Yeah, sure. This is a fantastic uh, talk. So uh, Jennifer, I have a question for you. So we are using more and more coronary CT. I cannot agree with you more that probably the bridges are not well reported or systematically reported. But in, in the case of a patient with INOCA and you see a bridge on the coronary CT, and we know that these bridges are present in about 30 to 50% of the cases that we ask for a CT. Uh, of course, there is the depth, there is the length, uh, quite some characteristics that you can assess in the bridge with CT. When do you take the decision to say, based on your CT, this is a patient that I'm going to take to the CAT lab and perform some invasive measurements to assess whether this bridge is significant or not. Yeah, so you can get some information from the CT, getting the, um, the MMI, which is, you know, basically the length and the depth. Um, I think it's reasonable to try empiric medical therapy um, and see if they respond to, um, you know, beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. But if they're not really responding and you, they may have these other issues as well, I think you go to the lab. Um, and I do think that intravascular ultrasound at that time is important to confirm that it's present. Um, and then you have to add this as extra testing. So um, it's more complicated, unfortunately. But again, if we're going to go to the trouble of taking these patients to the lab, we should get all the information we can for them. One question about natural history, and do you have any, or do, um, do you have any experience of sequential evaluations in a patient with a myocardial bridge? So say, for example, you positively make the diagnosis, but then implement some treatment recommendations, or you mentioned about surgery. Um, do, do we have any experience of the natural history of bridging and in and, and relation to patient symptoms and, and treatment? My well, impression, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 it's okay. I, th I thought that it was uh, to me, but very basically, and I will hand it to you, Jennifer. Um, I must say that in our center, we never had to do unroofing, which by the way is an intervention that uh, it is uh, not that uh, simple. I mean, it's, it requires a lot of skills and, uh, and we have uh, relied a lot in using uh, beta blockers as a way of decreasing uh, inotropism. But what about you, Jennifer? Yeah, I think one interesting thing is that I don't think bridges get better. I think bridges get worse, but bridges get worse at a slower rate than maybe obstructive disease. So we kind of see, you know, after 10 years or so, the symptoms just seem to be getting worse. Um, so in terms of natural history, that's important. Um, you know, unroofing can be a cure for people who, for years, we haven't been able to make them feel better, even with medicines. Um, 
So it sometimes is helpful. And then we've taken a couple of people back because they actually didn't feel better. Um, and sometimes from other institutions. And what we found is that the bridge wasn't completely unroofed. Um, so you make a very important point um, that it takes technical skill in the OR as well to make sure you fully unroof the bridge. Okay. Uh, one question from Oli Deer Sol Solberg um, about the uh, threshold with the non-hyperemic indices. Um, if these were used for decision making in relation to a bridge, would we accept a conventional cutoff of 0.89? Who knows? I think we don't know. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Yeah, I mean, my impression is that obviously you cannot apply a resting, the cutoffs of a resting index. Uh, and certainly, uh, whenever you are using, you know, the butamine or you are using adenosine with uh, an IFR, say, uh, software, you are no longer measuring IFR. You are measuring something that is more similar to diastolic FFR, right. and probably you know that is the way that um, this uh, either DFR or IFR, all these diastolic windows uh, or indices that are based on diastolic windows, probably they will be uh, variable as um, as surrogates of uh, diastolic FFR, and in that case, probably you should use the um, the similar cutoff that was used by Abe in 2000, or 0.75 or 0.80. But this is, of course, something speculative. And, uh, you know, as, as Jennifer mentioned, a lot of um, uh, room for investigation. Yeah. So I, I think that point just reminds us of understanding the technology and understanding the theory behind the, the, the tools that we use in the catheter, catheter laboratory. Um, we've had some questions about MRI, um, both in Minoka and in Oka. And the short answer, and in the interest of time, is yes, I think it's diagnostically useful, uh, especially with the advances in quantitative perfusion mapping, um, the post-processing that's done virtually in real time now. Um, but I think we should uh, move on. Um, we've got some uh, wrap-up slides, uh, which I think if I'm able to advance the, the slide... So we've reached the stage where we'd like to wrap up and just share with you the key learnings that I hope um, our audience is able to take away from this session uh, today. Um, that Enoka is a super family of subgroups, endotypes with specific disease mechanisms. And in the catheter laboratory, we now have the diagnostic tools to specifically identify and rule in or rule out. And that we can use these tools informed by clinical practice guidelines and that we have diagnostic criteria. And we should be aware of these criteria because they're simple, straightforward, and easily applicable in real time in the cath lab. And we've also been educated about myocardial bridges, that they're common, but that we need to think carefully about their evaluation non-invasively with CT and also in the catheter laboratory and that an individualized patient approach is recommended. And I think I heard uh, consider beta blockers first and then on to calcium channel blockers if need be, personalized approach. I'd like now to hand over to uh, Xavier. Thank you, Colin. Well, um, as uh, you uh, already specified at the beginning, this uh, webinar is uh, just a part of a series of webinars. It's the second one, but we still have five webinars uh, to come. Um, many of them will be focused on specific aspects of the medical diagnosis and management, but as you will see, uh, we will also put a lot of uh, focus on the um, way of informing the patients and informing also other colleagues who are in the clinical practice so they can get the best benefit of it. Remember that all the um, webinars are available at uh, www.pcronline.com. You have the address here and you can access uh, on demand at any time. Over to you again, uh, Colin. Thank you. So I think this session has been fantastic. We've had uh, great talks, great cases. Um, delighted that so many of our colleagues have joined us um, in the audience um, and engaged throughout submitting questions. I hope we've managed to cover them all. I'd like to thank our sponsor for this session, Abbott Vascular. 
and like to thank the organisers as well and wish you all a great Christmas and New Year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.